Back pain is child's play. This introduction is intentionally provocative and intended as an attention grabber. Anyone who is involved in caring for patients presenting with musculoskeletal pain has been told or is already convinced that it is difficult, impossible or takes years of learning. This is especially true when the focus of attention moves to specific areas like back and neck pain. The negative emotions regarding spinal diagnosis run deep and many go so far as to say that not only is it impossible, it may even be harmful when attempted. The issue of how providing a diagnosis might be harmful for patients is a matter the short presentation will set aside. It is really a different argument altogether. What we will focus on is the actual methodology of making a diagnosis. Any diagnosis, actually. My special area of interest is the musculoskeletal system and most particularly painful conditions affecting the low back. What we will do is look at a game that has been given to children to play for decades. My seven and eight year old grandchildren do it easily, yet it requires in principle the same methodology as what is used in scientific medicine to make a diagnosis. Obviously Specialised knowledge is required and I'm not suggesting that a seven-year-old can diagnose back pain. What I am saying, however, is that the method is simple. Learning what can go wrong with people's bodies takes an education. But once basic anatomy, physiology, pathology and epidemiology are known, the skills of examining a patient is learned, you can pose the right questions, answer them, and usually arrive at a good answer, that is, a diagnosis. This is a picture I acquired off the internet. It is a simple child's game called Guess Who, and is a game for two players. There are two card holders, one for each player, and both have the same 24 cards with pictures of different faces. There are separate cards that match each face. Each player randomly chooses who they are going to be without the other playing knowing who has been chosen. In this slide you can see that this player has chosen to be Tyrion. The opposing player chooses their own identity for the game. The players take turns to answer yes-no questions, progressively narrowing down the possibilities with each question. The player who successfully reasons who the other player has chosen using the least number of questions wins. Let's just play a simplified version so you are clear on the method. Here are 20 different cartoon faces. Just for the sake of this demonstration, let's say you have chosen to be the woman with ginger hair and lots of eyeshadow. Your opponent's first question is, do you have red hair? You answer no, since your choice has ginger hair. Your opponent can then eliminate all the redhead people from the card holder. Your opponent then asks, do you have black hair? The answer is no, so your opponent can eliminate all those with black hair. Your opponent then asks, do you have brown hair? And you answer no again, so your opponent can then eliminate all brown haired people from the card holder. Your opponent then asks, are you male? And you answer no. And your opponent is left with a single option, the correct answer. It is important to realize that it doesn't matter where your opponent starts in the process of elimination. Starting with the question, are you male, is just as valid and the process would proceed along a different path, yet still end up at the same conclusion, providing your opponent answers your questions truthfully, of course. So, now let's transfer the same methodology to the realm of lumbar spine diagnostics. I have reduced the number of options to the more common painful disorders and some of the uncommon ones. There are others, obviously, but for the sake of this demonstration, this will serve the purpose. 
have a look at these 12 options and think about the characteristics of each category or diagnosis. Pausing the video here is helpful so you can consider what these characteristics might be. Now let's say your back pain patient has completed a pain drawing. The central sensitization inventory questionnaire. You have asked all the red flag screening questions, taken a full clinical history of the current pain problem, and past problems with back pain issues. You have done a physical examination of the patient that includes a screening neurologic examination, the pain provocation sacroiliac joint tests, a basic hip examination that includes passive and resistive tests, and completed a McKenzie repeated movements assessment to determine if the symptoms have a clear directional preference or can be centralized or not. Now you're ready to play the game of guess the painful condition, or more professionally, why is this patient hurting and where is the pain coming from? In other words, lumbar spine diagnosis. Here are the possible diagnostic categories we are considering for this game. And let's assume that the patient has drawn his pain like this. And these are the essential details from your history and physical examination. Quickly jot down these details or do a screen copy and print it out. You could pause here too, that would help. Let's look at the options again and start eliminating diagnoses based on what we know of this patient's problem. Well, the first thing you can do is rule out radicular pain caused by a herniated disc. There is no radicular pain on the pain drawing. So this can go. Spinal stenosis can go too because this never only causes back pain. Other radicular pain syndromes can be eliminated too as can hip joint and gluteal sources of pain because they never only cause back pain above the sacrum. Next, we can rule out central sensitization because the scores on the CSI questionnaire are within their normal ranges. The total lack of any suggestion of intermittent claudication allows us to rule out aortic or iliac vessel stenosis, so this can go as well. The red flag screening questions didn't suggest any hint of a nasty pathology like cancer, so this can go as well as fractures. The fact that only one sacroiliac joint pain provocation test was positive means we can rule out the sacroiliac joint as a source of pain and the central symmetrical pain description effectively rules out the facet joint as well. This leaves the anterior column as a possible source of pain. The pain drawing is consistent with a painful midline structure, so is it mechanical disc disturbance? or a non-mechanical anterior column pain like internal disc disruption or symptomatic end plate changes. The fact that the symptoms could be centralized and showed a clear directional preference with the McKenzie repeated movement assessment indicates that this is a mechanical disc disturbance rather than a non-mechanical one. So we are now left with a single diagnosis, mechanical discogenic pain. It so happens that centralization is highly specific to controlled provocation discography, so our diagnosis is almost certainly the right one. How about this patient then? The pain drawing is different from the previous patient, isn't it? Pain is unilateral with only subjective stiffness across the back and centrally. It is dominant below L5 as well. Here are the details that you can quickly jot down or do a screen dump for printing. As an exercise on your own, you could stop here and try and work it out for yourself. All information for a structural diagnosis is here. So let's work through this example now. The most obvious thing is this patient's age. She's young. Her CSI score is normal and there are no red flags. 
So let's get rid of these highly unlikely diagnoses. The lack of obvious trauma in a fit, strong, athletic and well-nourished woman and the lack of any evidence of radicular pain allows us to rule these out as well. The McKenzie Repeated Movement Assessment not only failed to demonstrate a directional preference or the centralization phenomenon, but the patient also described a slowly increasing baseline discomfort as the assessment continued. Her baseline level of pain just got worse the more I moved her in any direction. This would be considered to perhaps be an inflammatory pattern. Thus we can rule out mechanical discogenic pain anyway. Her hips moved through a normal range of motion and only caused slight pain at the end range of medial rotation. Thus, hip pain is highly unlikely. Lumbar facet joint pain is really, if ever, a cause of pain felt only in the buttock. Plus, the lack of trauma in a young person means we can rule this out too. This leaves us with either non-mechanical discogenic or vertebral end plate pain or a symptomatic sacroiliac joint. In this case, five of the sacroiliac joint pain provocation tests were very painful, even with relatively minor forces applied. The likelihood that this is sacroiliac joint pain rises substantially, and we can say with some confidence that if anesthetic were injected into the right sacroiliac joint, the pain would almost certainly disappear, at least as long as the anesthetic is in effect. Now this case is clearly different from the previous two. First, the leg pain is the dominant complaint and the history is much shorter. In addition, she has a marked left lateral shift which increases in backward bending and stays unchanged in flexion. This deformity is not idiopathic scoliosis but it developed rapidly shortly after her accident. Her x-rays revealed no fracture or bony reason for the deformity. Though her neurologic screening examination revealed normal symmetrical power of all key muscle groups and normal sensory uh, discrimination, both left and right straight leg raise tests provoked her right-sided radicular pain. This is a classic presentation and diagnosis is child's play too. So let's play. Because her hips examined normally, we can dismiss this possibility. Her age, the traumatic onset, allow us to eliminate several possibilities like spinal metastases, spinal stenosis and peripheral vascular disease. X-rays are normal, so any major fracture can be eliminated. However, minor fractures may be missed, but we can actually eliminate all these two because she did actually have an MRI that ruled it out. The repeated movement assessment included attempted correction of the left lateral shift. This was not successful, and although it initially looked like centralization might be possible, any effect was very short-lived. So we can rule out the internal mechanical disc derangement that we believe is related to the centralization phenomenon. The dominant lower extremity pain is not a feature of disc pain, so non-mechanical discogenic pain may be ruled out as well, although the backache component of her problem may well be caused by the injured disc. The acute lateral shift is not associated with the sacroiliac joint, so we can ignore any positive provocation sacroiliac joint tests and rule out the sacroiliac joint. And for the same reason, we can rule out the facet joints. Well, what are we left with? Clearly, the pain drawing and her description of pain is of nerve root compression or irritation. This is more technically called radicular pain. Sensitization may well be an issue here, but it is clear that the basic underlying pain mechanism has a very pathoanatomic foundation. I think it is safe to rule out sensitization, even though she never completed the questionnaire we now use to assess this. 
So is this radicular pain caused by a herniated disc or some other pathology? Well, we do know that the cross straight leg raise test has very high specificity for radicular pain caused by a herniated disc. So we can rule out the less common causes of radicular pain and make a confident diagnosis of a herniated disc causing radicular pain. In fact, she did have an MRI and a relevant disc herniation was confirmed. A selective epidural abolished her pain temporarily and she underwent discectomy with a very good outcome. This simple process of elimination is what I call diagnosis by subtraction. It has a solid foundation in biostatistics and may be augmented by other well understood concepts for ruling in and ruling out other possible diagnoses. I have shown you three examples of real patients to give you an idea of how it works. My main purpose is to emphasize that a reasonably confident diagnosis is possible in most cases of patients with back pain and that this process may be used in many situations, medical or otherwise. In fact, any quest for identification of real life phenomena probably uses this method. It's not difficult or even new. The use of diagnosis by subtraction in clinical diagnosis requires significant content knowledge. This knowledge can be acquired from many postgraduate courses. My course on lumbar spine diagnosis is 90% online and available to licensed English speaking clinicians. And there is a French language version as well. If you are a clinician, have a look at the Southern Musculoskeletal Seminars website. If you are a back pain sufferer who has been told that diagnosis is difficult or expensive or that you have non-specific low back pain, change your clinician or tell your clinician to have a look at this website. You will not follow my precept. How often have I said to you that once you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. An ancestor of mine maintained that if you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Watson, how often have I said to you, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth? Oh, very often. Very well then, it applies now. If you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Once you rule out the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be true. The probable origin of the idea of diagnosis by subtraction is from Mill's methods. In the 19th century, John Stuart Mill identified various methods of scientific induction. And the method, I believe, is the one used or is the basis of diagnosis by subtraction is Mill's method, the method of residue subduct from any phenomenon such part as is known by previous inductions to be the effect of certain antecedents and the residue of the phenomenon is the phenomenon is the effect of the remaining antecedents. And here's my final message. The concept of non-specific low back pain is a dinosaur. Those who use it to describe most back pain patients are simply announcing their ignorance or evasion of current knowledge and scientific evidence. It is time to bury the concept and consign it to history where it properly belongs.